The Tom Woods Show, episode 1930. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, don't even think about missing the libertarian event of the year the 2000th episode of The Tom Woods Show, live in Orlando, featuring many of your favorites from The Tom Woods Show. And Michael Malice says his special surprise guest, whose identity I myself don't even know, will bring the house down. Cost nothing to attend. Register at TomWoods2000.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. I'm delighted to be joined by documentary filmmaker Steve Oldfield today. His latest project is the documentary Rush to Judgment, which was screened at Porkfest and will be also featured at the Anthem Film Festival at Freedom Fest in South Dakota this month. And it's about what happened to those Covington Catholic High School students when a short, misleading video clip went viral and the whole world condemned these boys for apparently being insensitive and displaying their white privilege and this and that, when in fact the reality couldn't have been farther from that. And this documentary goes very deeply into this and examines a lot of aspects of it that even I myself, who spent a lot of time on it, hadn't thought of. So it's very important. Check out RushToJudgmentDocumentary.com. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm a big fan. I love to listen to all your podcasts. Thank you so much. It was great to meet you at Porkfest and to get to see your film myself so I can speak from a position of, uh, you know, I, I can be informed when we talk about it. Let's first start with your background. How did you come to be involved in this documentary project? Well, I was one of those kids who grew up watching the evening news with Walter Cronkite from the time I was four years old and wanted to be a journalist for years and years. Went to Northwestern's Medill School of Journalism, where I founded Northwestern Student Television back in 1985. It still goes on today as a different name, um, Northwestern News Now, I think they call it. But I was a TV news guy for 25 years. I worked, I was one of those news nomads, Tom, if you're familiar with that term. Every two or three years, you jump to a different market in hopes of a better gig. And I was Denver, Richmond, Detroit, Salt Lake, Orlando, Miami, New York, LA. And uh, never really felt fulfilled, to be honest with you. The, The longer we got into it, the more the business had changed. If you remember, Walter Cronkite was considered the most trusted man in America back in the 70s and 80s. And I've seen the business completely go to hell since then. So I decided I would uh, move back home and start teaching. I I teach at Thomas More University, um, communication and documentary filmmaking, and then started doing docs and long range projects where I could really control the content instead of doing a two minute story for the news. So that's kind of how that all happened. When did this whole incident occur? Was it 2020 or 19? 2019. Yeah. And I should say, you know, the the school at the heart of this whole story where Nick Salmon went is called Covington Catholic, which is in Kentucky, right by Cincinnati, Ohio. And I coincidentally went to the competing school, Covington Latin. So I grew up my whole life really hating Covington Catholic because I didn't get to go to state in tennis because I was beaten by a kid from CovCath and, and never really liked the school at all. And then as an adult, I was doing a leadership group for high school students and lo and behold, some CovCath kids showed up and they didn't have horns and they weren't horrible people. And I even liked their teacher. And uh, I did a video for them in 2018 and had all this exclusive video that I owned inside the school. And then January, 2019, I, I, get my Facebook and I check it in the morning when I wake up every day. I'm an old guy. I don't check Twitter. I check Facebook. And friends of mine from Northwestern and from all over the country in journalism were slamming this kid who happened to be from CovCath. And I started defending him and saying, surely there's more to this story. Don't just believe this picture. I know these kids. They're not monsters. And I started defending CovCath. And I'm still in that position now a year and a half later. I remember when the whole thing happened. There was a video that you could watch on YouTube that had been taken, it's just an amateur video taken by somebody. And it was almost two hours long and it allowed you to see the entire context of what happened. And I was so sure that the spin being put on this was wrong that I sat down and watched that entire video. I wrote about it and commented on it, did podcast episodes on it. It was shocking what you see in the video if you take the time to watch it. Now, if we hadn't had, you know, for all the things we rightly complain about, about the internet today, 
we hadn't had the internet, if we'd had to rely on Walter Cronkite, this kid would never have had his day in court. There would have been that 30 second clip way out of context and his life would have been ruined. You're right. I would have expected you to have watched that because you're that kind of guy. But it's so sad that so many journalists who are at some of the premier organizations in the country didn't bother. That little clip was enough for them. And I think part of the problem with all this, Tom, is that particularly inside the Beltway, as we call it, inside the Washington, D.C. corridor, all of these guys are friends with each other on Twitter and Facebook. And if one of them puts it out there, like the Washington Post or CNN, they all consider it the gold standard and they then share it too. And people have to remember, if you're sharing someone else's post, it's pretty much like you're putting your own stamp of approval on it. And that's what happened in this case. Once the Washington Post started doing stories and all the other people, that they just assumed everything about it was accurate and they were all terribly wrong. Well, let's now get into what the basics of the uh, incident were for anyone who doesn't remember or may not have followed it. Sure. What happened was we saw a very brief clip on social media of what appeared to be a situation, or at least the way it was spun to us, was that there was a Native American man banging a drum, and we were told that white kids had surrounded him and were mocking him as he beat his drum. And there was one kid in particular, this Nick Sandman, who was staring him down while smirking. And so this was taken as evidence of white privilege and the entitled attitude of white men by the usual suspects. We got people on social media with big followings saying that that guy had a very punchable face. Is there anybody more punchable than that kid? I really like to punch that kid. So they already know that they want to punch him. They want to do him violence. They already know everything they need to know about him because he's wearing a Make America Great Again hat and he's smirking at a Native American guy banging his drum. That was what everybody saw. And that's why you, you call it rush to judgment. Everybody, And of course, as usual and on schedule, in the so-called conservative movement, because the conservative movement is full of people who are desperate to appease the left. Oh, they're big. They stick their chests out and talk about how brave they are. But when push comes to shove, they're terrified of the left. And they want to get out in front of this and say, we're also against the racism in this video. The left never does that. In reverse, it never happens in reverse. Right. If there's some left-wing kid who looks like he did the wrong thing, the left doesn't immediately rush out and say, oh, we we sympathize with all you conservatives. That's really wrong. They don't act like that. That's why they're not losers. And unfortunately, the conservative movement winds up being losers over and over again because they do stuff like this. All right, sorry for my editorializing, but I had to get that off no, my no, chest. No, no, you're, you're right. And in this case, it was really amazing how many people did just what you're talking about, virtue signaling in the case. And that was Megan McCain had a big tweet about that. And Nick Sandman and the other kids from Covington Catholic were at Washington for the March for Life. They were all there for you know that annual protest against abortion. And even the March for Life came out and issued a press release and said, we, you know, the March for Life is about peace and we don't support this. Everybody threw this kid under the bus. Even the Bishop of Covington, who was under pressure, apparently from higher up in the Catholic Church, issued a statement and said, we're going to investigate and we may take disciplinary action up to and including expulsion. And when that happened, when the Washington Post did what they did and when the Bishop did what he did, those were two kind of green light, go say whatever horrible thing you want about this kid, because even his own bishop is questioning what he did. And later, the bishop had a thorough investigation and apologized and actually went to the school and did a whole big mea culpa and fell on his sword. But those first few days, you know, it was too late. All the rush to judgment really put this kid in a bad situation. And what people don't realize about all these hateful things on social media sometimes. It, may, it might feel good to say the worst, most horrible thing you can think of. But when you throw those kinds of attacks at a 16-year-old boy and his family, people threatened to scalp him, to blow up his house, to blow up the school. They were given police protection, Nick and his family, and he had to go to his little brothers and say, pack a backpack, we've got to escape our house right now. And the, his father tells the story that as they were all you know, going down the driveway to get to a secret location, all the TV news satellite trucks were driving toward his house. And um, it's like a scene out of a movie or a horror story. Well, if you're ever in a position where your situation relies on the bravery of an American bishop, 
you are sunk. That's just a general rule. <laughs> These people, if they ever had any backbone before they became bishops, part of the ceremony of becoming a bishop involves the removal of the spine. That's it's a little known part of the ceremony. So let's talk about then, let's contextualize this. In what context could this famous smirk be understandable? It, was it the case that uh, this person, this Native American man who we, we now know was named Nathan Phillips, was he in any danger? Was he being surrounded by them? Was he really making peace, which is what he claimed he was doing? What's the context? Well, you know, when, when Ryan Anderson, our producer, watched the same video that you did and called me up on that Saturday night and said, look, I just spent two hours of my life watching this, the video evidence is clear that Nathan Phillips walked into the crowd. He claimed that he was trying to go with his friends to, to apparently to stare lovingly at, at Abraham Lincoln at the top of the Lincoln Memorial. But there was a clear path to the Lincoln Memorial that he completely avoided. And he chose to walk right into this group of kids. Now, the group of kids had been experiencing some pretty heavy duty, pretty mean spirited taunting from a group of gentlemen who, if you've ever been to Washington, D.C., you've probably encountered them at some point or another. They go by the Hebrew Israelites. That's their term. And they were saying really, really racist stuff to the kids. And they were also saying racist stuff to Nathan Phillips and his team. And in the middle of all this, the kids decided they would do something they do every year when they go to D.C. They do what they call their spirit chants. And they were doing all these kind of cheers to try to drown out the hate that was being spewed by the Hebrew Israelites. So at that point, I think Nathan and his team, they started rolling their cameras, of which they had many. And they, they walked into this kind of firestorm thinking, what can we do to get some publicity here? And that's how this all started. So the interesting thing, there's so many interesting things about this to me, but this Nathan Phillips, who is a con man through and through, he gave repeated interviews to CNN in which almost nothing out of his mouth was true. It was like he was describing a completely different event. None of these things occurred. The kids never chanted, build that wall, which would have made no sense in a confrontation with a Native American anyway. Correct. They never chanted that. He was never in any danger. The black men who were the Hebrew Israelites were never in any danger from the kids, the way Phillips presented it, that they were the predators and the, these black men were their prey. Are you kidding me? These kids were sitting there bewildered that they were being shouted at by people they had never met, even though they hadn't done a, a darn thing. Yes. It's incredible that this story could have been spun that way. Then we were told he's a Vietnam veteran, which the media, I love you, had, you spent a little time on this. The media just accepted that because he said it. Right. Because they wanted him to be a Vietnam veteran exactly. because that would make these entitled little white little jerks deserve even more of the abuse they were getting. Yeah, and, and I have to say, listeners of a certain age will remember this. One of the most powerful public service announcements ever made was a Native American with a single tear going down his face for Keep America Beautiful. If you were alive in the 70s, you no doubt saw that over and over on television. And that's how they were portraying Nathan Phillips. Here was this distinguished Native American who was being attacked by this Trump follower. And lo and behold, not only is he a Native American, he's a Vietnam vet, ding, 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 right? So that was that made his story even more awful that this kid, you know, the smirk was a smirk against veterans. It was a smirk against Native Americans. It was a smirk against everything American. And the other thing that was so amazing to me, Tom, is that one of the things that Nathan says when he's being interviewed is, I thought these kids could tear me apart. And you look, all the kids have a big smile on their face. They're all just kind of, and they, while they didn't say build the wall, you can clearly hear the kids say more than once, what's going on? What is this all about? And, and that's what was really happening. But, but instead, Nathan went with this narrative that he was afraid for his life. Yeah, a favorite. Not, and as it turns out, by a, a weird coincidence, not, no one laid a hand on him. How about no. that? What a, no. what a big surprise. So he thought, I'm going to bring peace to this situation where these kids are sitting there not sure what's happening while they're being abused by people who are abusing my people, yeah. who are saying that my Native Americans deserve to lose their land because they worship the wrong God. Right. And we're all Uncle Tomahawks with our heads up the white man's ass, which right. is what was said to them. Yep. Let's see. So that's going on. In order to make peace, instead of approaching the small number of Hebrew Israelites, 
I'll approach the students who are just sitting there taking it. Yeah. Why didn't you go approach the Hebrew Israelites who were screaming racist things at both the students and you? Well, could it be because no one in his right mind would have that confrontation? Yeah. And number two, that wouldn't give you the publicity you want, yeah. you con man? Exactly. And, you know, the kids from Covington Catholic had all been told, don't interact with people, just do your own thing. And if anybody comes up to you, just clam up and say nothing. And that's exactly what Nick Sandman did. And everybody talks about that smirk. When we interviewed him, Ryan and I posed for a picture with Nick. And when we looked at it, we had to laugh because that's the same look he had on his face. You know, that, that some kids just have that kind of, kind of you know, goofy grin and um, God love him. That, that's just kind of Nick being Nick. And he was, he was just bewildered. And it's amazing how everyone rushed to judgment and read so much into that scene. But again, I, I think none of it would have happened had he not been wearing the mega hat and had it not been a Native American who, who looked so um, worthy of our respect um, by first look. And he had that chiseled face and, and um, beating the drum. He just, central casting in Hollywood would love to have him for a movie, you know, and that's what was so sad about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I, my advice to him would be, if you actually do want to make peace in the future, banging a drum right in someone's personal space <laughs> is actually not going to be interpreted as a sign of peace. Just just, oh. just so you know, this is just the way society works. The other thing I want to mention, I learned some things from your documentary, despite having watched the complete footage of the thing. For one thing, I didn't realize that early on, there was a case of mistaken identity where people were trying to figure out what is the name of this smirking kid and they got the name wrong. And so the kid who was falsely singled out wound up getting all sorts of abuse and they tried to ruin his professional career that he wanted they to have. By, his, yeah, so talk about that. Yeah, his name is Hodge, H-O-D-G-E. And uh, he wasn't even in Washington because his brother was getting married. It was the first wedding in his family. And thanks to the internet, people were able to Google and find out his mom's cell phone number. So they're on their way driving to the bride's house to help her get ready for the wedding. And this woman she's never met before starts screaming at Hodge's mom and saying all these horrible things. Somebody even said to her, you should have aborted your kid. And they, when they came home from the wedding, there were 7,000 Twitter, angry Twitter messages lodged at the Hodges. And they were told that um, they were going to have a sheriff's deputy sitting in their parking lot because everybody said they were going to scalp him. And then some people were actually trying to get to the wedding to disrupt the actual wedding, which thankfully didn't happen. But you can imagine what that was like. And he wasn't even there. And he um, wanted to be a chef. He had been featured in a magazine article that mentioned that online. So on that Monday morning, Cincinnati State, which has one of the top culinary programs in our region, received dozens of calls and emails saying, reject this kid's application. You don't want a racist in your program. And people tried to ruin his life and he was the wrong kid. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable what happened to this kid who, as you say, wasn't even there. Yeah. Now then, let's talk about uh, somebody you interviewed for this documentary. There was some special abuse aimed at a black student at the school yeah. and where the Hebrew Israelites were claiming that the white students were going to harvest his organs. Now, yep. a couple of years have passed since then. No organ harvesting has occurred. So it turns out that that completely insane claim turns out to be false. How about that? That's another hard thing to predict. You actually got to interview him and his family. Yep. I didn't realize what the outcome of this is, but what a tragedy. Yeah, this um, he goes by Bo and like a lot of kids in our region, their dream is to go to Covington Catholic because they're a perennial state tournament in football, and they're you know they send kids to West Point and and Notre Dame and and all and USC and Alabama and all the top schools for their football team. And this kid Bo wasn't Catholic, but but really wanted to go to Covington Catholic. His parents actually moved their business, moved their house, so they could be closer to Covington Catholic. He was going to the school. He loved everything about it. You know, he was on the freshman football team. Things were going great for him. And then this happens. And the Hebrew Israelites were taunting all the, all the Cuffcat kids and saying, you don't even have a black kid here. And they said, no, we do. Here's, here's they, his nickname was Kanye. They called him Kanye. And they brought him out. And these 
these Hebrew Israelites said all kinds of horrible things, including they're going to harvest your organs. Well, when he gets back to school, when school finally opened, it had been shut down because of bomb threats and terrorist threats against them after this all happened. He goes back to school and what are a bunch of high school boys? It's an all boys school. What are they going to do? That's what they were going to joke about. And they, they said, you know, do you still have your organs? You know, or you're, you better be careful. And the kid basically went into PTSD. He was completely freaked out. And this is a tough kid. I've met him. I've spent time with him. I know his aunt really well, coincidentally. And um, he, he wasn't having any of it. And he ended up transferring schools. Now, the good news is he transferred to a school that has another great football program and everybody has accepted him into that system. But, um, you know, Covcath tried to get him counseling. They tried to do all this stuff to work with him. And the, the father, for the record, his dad holds no malice toward Covington Catholic and he gets that kids will be kids. But, um, and he said too, he said, when, when my son was going to the March for Life, I prepared him you know, to see people walking around in vagina hats and all these people who are, you know, my body, my choice. And he, he prepared him to be attacked by a bunch of feminazis, you know, who always go after the March for Life. But he said, I didn't prepare him to be attacked by men of his own race who were saying all kinds of horrible things to him. So, yeah, so that traumatic event was a true tragedy. And, you know, and he was not getting um, any kind of settlement from CNN or the Washington Post or anything. He basically just had to sit out the rest of his year and homeschool and finish the year and then transfer to another high school. Oh, jeez. All right. Well, what do we know? Do we know anything about, I mean, did Nick Sandman, what, what had ever happened with the case? I, I guess it, the idea is that we don't know the exact terms of it, but they settled with him? Well, it's interesting. Um, Washington Post and CNN settled. And one of the things that I don't think people realize, and this is important for any journalists listening to this podcast as well, it's not just the copy that you write that can get you in trouble for libel and slander and defamation. It's the links that you provide. And one of the big issues that the Sandman family and the attorneys took with the Washington Post was that they had that classic thing. If, so you've read this story. If you like it, here are three other stories you might be interested in. Those links went to stories about white supremacists, about neo-Nazis. So the implication was that Nick Sandman was a neo-Nazi and a white supremacist. So that was the big issue with them. And I think they were caught so red-handed and so much with their pants down, they just settled rather than fight the case. The lawsuits continue against NBC, against, I think, the New York Times, Gannett News Service, and a bunch of other people. And they're still in the um, discovery phase of those cases right now. They're being represented by a really um, sharp attorney named Todd McMurtry. I check with Todd every couple of weeks and he says, you know, we're still, it's, it's grinding along very slowly, but some of the news organizations are, are doubling down and, and they're, they're not about to settle. And um, he's hoping to prove that, um, you know, that they were just as, uh, as guilty as um, the Washington Post and CNN, which by the way, as you know, the way those lawsuits work, neither of them were required to basically say they did anything wrong. That was part of their lawsuit um, settlement. But um, he's hoping that he can show malice and, and you know, egregious errors that um, really affected the life of this boy and his family and the school. What, what do you want people to walk away from this documentary thinking and or doing? That's a great question. Several things. I think the next time you see something viral, whether it's a video clip or a photo, and there's some kind of interpretive headline or interpretive line telling you what you should be reading into this. Take a step back and say what really happened. Do what you did in this case and look up and look for other video, look for other content. That's the great thing about Google and YouTube. You can find other sides. And before you just look at something and say, oh, that's awful, and then retweet it or repost it, really look at it because ultimately, you're, if you do that, your name is going on it and you're saying, I agree with what's been said. And in this case, the other thing that I thought that CBS uncovered in this whole thing was that the original Twitter account that posted all this and talked about, look at this terrible example of, you know, a racism in Trump's white America or whatever, was a fake Twitter account. They used a photo of some actress from Brazil and claimed it was a teacher from Northern California. The whole thing was fake. We'll never know who the people were who actually posted that because 
the Democrats in, in Washington started an investigation to see if maybe there was some Russian connection to all of this. And since there wasn't, since they determined that it was something that was happened in America, they stopped investigating. But this was all started by a fake Twitter account. So I guess my first thing would be, don't be fooled and just rush to judgment. And then, and then the second thing is, you really have to step back and say, is it really worth trying to come up with the meanest, most awful thing I can say to attack somebody? And in this case, it was a minor. It was a kid being told the most, I wouldn't even repeat on this show, a lot of the things that were said to this kid, all because of people rushing to judgment and wanting to virtue signal, wanting to look like, look how woke and awesome I am. I'm going to attack a teenage boy. Hey, everybody, let's take a minute to say a word about one of my favorite things in the world, the happily date box. A lot of folks are in great relationships, but their schedules are so tight and they're running around and everything's hectic, and they never really get around to those romantic getaways that they know they need. They're never really able to carve out that quality time together that is essential to that relationship. Conversely, you can have people in relationships where they're constantly doing things together, but they'd like to have something fun that they can do quietly at home from time to time. And the Happily Date Box is just what the doctor ordered in both cases. We absolutely love it. Every month, Happily sends us a themed box containing activities, conversation starters, a music playlist that bring us closer together. And the theme could be the 1980s or France or Greece or game shows or whatever. And inside you'll find games, crafts, all kinds of activities you could not have thought up yourself. And the result is a wonderful evening together that brings you closer. And men, if you think of this without having to be prompted by her, you will be a hero. We'll take 50% off your first date when you go to tomwoods.com slash date. That's 50% off your first date. So men, no excuse not to try this at tomwoods.com slash date. Did you have any trouble getting to interview people you wanted to? Were there any, was there anybody who just had had it with the media, either friendly or unfriendly? Well, I will say it took a lot of in-person meetings and lunches and you know promises. Fortunately, Northern Kentucky is a very small community, and almost every one of the people involved, I had either gone to high school or, or known somebody who knew them, who could vouch for me. I had been on local TV news here. For a couple of years, and I, you know, I, I so I think some people remembered my name or face from that. So the Cuffcath people and the people who were all wronged were very, you know, at first reluctant, but then they were willing to talk. And um, once I got one of them, they kind of said, "Well, here, you know, Oldfield's not out to to screw us over. You can trust him." And uh, but on the other side, it's been really difficult. You know, we Nathan Phillips, like the Sandmans, like everybody else, was doxed. His personal information was put out there, and a lot of people were very upset, and rightfully so, particularly people who were into that whole stolen valor movement where they felt like he was pretending like he was a Vietnam vet when he had just been a refrigerator mechanic in Nebraska during the Vietnam War. Um, so he went under. I'm sorry, I can't. Well. I have to laugh at that. I'm sorry, refrigerator mechanic in Nebraska is not really the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, as, as you know, dodging Agent Orange and, and bullets from all sides and flying around in a helicopter. Yeah, not not the same at all. So he went underground. So we weren't able, we tried and tried and tried to get somebody from his group and couldn't. And then the other thing is, none of the news organizations would talk to us because of pending litigation. And even the ones who weren't involved, you know, that's a club. You know, mainstream media is a big a big fraternity. And none of them wanted to go on record because, or, or review my film because they don't want to look like they're slamming their buddies. And that's been, that's been the most frustrating part is that, you know, we can't even get people to watch it. Film festivals won't touch it. Most of them accept the awesome Anthem Film Festival, which is part of Freedom Fest. But a lot of film festivals won't even, won't even touch it because they feel like it goes against their narrative and their club and their, their buddies on the left. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. So, therefore, number one, how can people watch it? And is, is there any way they can help you? Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, well, if they're, you know, Freedom Fest and the Anthem Film Festival this year is going to be later this month in South Dakota. They're moving from Vegas and there's still open seats. It's going to be in a beautiful 500 seat theater on the Friday of, of Anthem and Freedom Fest. And uh, we would love for people to come out and see it that way. Also, if you go to rush2judgmentdocumentary.com, 
there's a link and we do have a, a Vimeo version that will be available that they'll be able to watch it um, on Vimeo. And we also um, are being represented. This is one of the coolest things of, of all, Tom. I don't know if you've ever heard of Contemporary Issues Agency. It's um, an agency that books speaking engagements on college campuses. And I would say 90% of their speakers tend to be on more on the liberal side of things. It's a husband and wife team who run it. I met them at a, at a convention, coincidentally, in Covington and told them our story and they represent us. And we have a, an hour presentation that we give the college campuses that we've created about the very issues we've talked about today, about civil discourse, about you know not rushing to judgment. So that kind of came out of this. So if you would like us to come and speak either virtually or in person, there's information about that on our website. You can watch a trailer. If you want to buy our hat, because Ryan's idea was to take the Make America Great hat and to make our documentary title Rush to Judgment on a, on a hat, a red hat. So if you want a hat, you can do that too. Okay, great. So Rush to Judgment documentary.com. And I'm going to link to that also on our show notes page, which is tomwoods.com slash 1930. And just say, I've seen the documentary myself. It's excellent. It's necessary. You're going to want to watch it. So check out our show notes page and head on over and take a look. Steve, thanks so much for your time. You know, having your support means a lot. For the people who weren't at Porkfest, you were a rock star there, man. Thank you. Standing ovations. People loved what you had to say. And I'm a big fan. And I, uh, I've i shared your COVID quiz. Oh, good. Everybody <laughs> I know. And um, I think it's really important. So we can't thank you enough for supporting what we're doing. Well, my pleasure. Okay, everybody, let me tell you what I've got coming up here. Monday, Germinal G. Van joins us to talk about the economic condition of Black America over the course of the 20th century. Then Gene Epstein comes back to the show to answer a listener question that I got from the Q&A session I do every month with the, uh, the elite of the elite of my supporting listeners. Check that out, supportinglisteners.com. You should be in that program. Uh, somebody wanted to know, what about the national debt? Does it really matter? And if so, can you explain for a layman why it matters? and what effects it really has on us. And that's a great question because it doesn't seem like it does anything. People have been complaining about the debt for a long time and it doesn't seem like there are any real effects. So Gene is going to come back on, talk to us about that. If all goes well, I'm going to have an episode on Antifa next week. It's going to be a great week. So if you feel like this podcast adds value to your life and you're benefiting from it, then do please consider becoming a supporting listener because supporting listeners, not only do they warm my heart, but also... I give you a lot of great goodies in that program. I mean, and it's ever expanding. And I even have special events just with you guys. And it's a wonderful program to be part of. And I really do appreciate it. Now, of course, if you can't do that, if you just share the podcast episodes with your friends, I'm grateful for that. Or share them on social media. That really, really helps the show. But that supporting listeners program is so great. And you get to be a member of the Tom Woods Show Elite, which is the best group of normal people you ever heard of. So check that out at supportinglisteners.com, and I'll see you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.